Welcome back everybody to another episode of Direct Comparison. In today's episode, we're going to take an in-depth look at the hotly anticipated new Spider-Man game, Spider-Man 2, and see how it stacks up both visually and from a gameplay perspective to the previous mainline installment, Spider-Man Remastered. For this comparison, both games are being played on the PlayStation 5, with the visual mode set to the fidelity setting and post-processing effects like motion blur, chromatic aberration, and film grain disabled when possible in order to capture cleaner images for comparison. I've also decided to include a little bit of Spider-Man Miles Morales in this comparison as well, as it not only gives us a better look at Miles and his spider suit, but will also highlight some of the changes that have already been made to the series, both in terms of the environmental layout and general gameplay mechanics. And before we get started, I'd like to thank PlayStation and Insomniac for providing me with an early access review key for this video. Though, because it won't be releasing until the 20th, I'm going to try my best to avoid any major spoilers, and will avoid discussing material from the later sections of the game. Alright, so let's kick this comparison off by first discussing the presentation on offer, starting with the design of Spider-Man himself. Now right away, the first thing you're probably noticing here when looking at these two side by side is the slight difference in the coloration. Here we have an identical suit, with Spidey standing right in the center of Times Square at the exact same location in the middle of the day. Though, due to slight variances in the ambient lighting in either game, the end result is an image that appears far warmer and less saturated. This appears to be solely dependent on the base directional lighting at play as the suit color can still appear very close to the same as before if the settings are manually tweaked via the built-in photo mode. Though, as you'll see throughout the course of this video, Spider-Man 2 overall has a much warmer tone to it, likely attributed to the new, late summer time frame for the game's story. What this does mean, however, is that some of those really fine details attributed to the suit aren't quite as noticeable now. Take the textured surface of Spider-Man's mask, for example, in Spider-Man Remastered, shown on the left, you can very clearly see each individual line of the small, oval-shaped cells to the suit's surface, with specular lighting and shadowing helping to define the surface a great deal. While, yes, we can still see that same surface in Spider-Man 2, you'll notice the shapes aren't nearly as defined this go-around. In fact, the textured pattern seems to lose its form directly under the eyepiece, turning into more of a series of wavy lines. It's possible the redirected lighting is at least partially to blame here, though it's also likely that this particular advanced suit option just isn't as detailed as it was before. This is because Spider-Man 2's new and improved Advanced Suit 2.0 is intended to be Peter's primary outfit, with much sharper texture work than even the advanced suit before. The overall design of the suit itself appears to be slightly more simplified, Scrapping things like the rubber seams and indents along the torso, removing the red pattern from the legs, and integrating a more rich brick red coloration over the previous almost brownish red tone that was used before. From a technical perspective, the new suit offers much higher image quality than the old suit, with textures that feel very well defined, coupled with fantastic specular lighting and ambient occlusion that really makes it pop on the screen more. Things like Pete's eyes now appear sharper and more complex due to the smaller eye pattern being used. And the carbon fiber-esque material of the new suit stands out much better than the old synthetic rubber looking material used before. It's also worth mentioning Peter's other new suit, the Symbiote. The Symbiote suit plays just as big a role throughout the course of the game as Peter's standard suit. Unlike the other suits, this one looks and behaves more organically with the surface of the skin being animated to slowly flow around each segmented piece. The specularity is also increased, giving it this gross, slimy appearance, and there's quite a few reflective properties at play too. Because the surface is animated, the actual texture maps themselves don't appear quite as sharp as the other suits, and you get this muddy impression when looking at the suit in a still image. But in action, it looks perfectly fine, and looks even better when mixed in with the various unique organic actions available to the player. Special attacks, swings, and sticky goo replacing the web shooters all go a long way in selling the symbiote in this game world, something that the game gets plenty of opportunity to play around with. Moving on, we can't forget about our second Spider-Man, Miles Morales. Now, with Miles, the changes made to his primary suit are more subtle. 
Again, the coloration here is primarily the result of the ambient lighting in the scene. So at first glance, it looks as though the new suit is much darker than before. And to some extent, this is true, as the original suit does appear slightly lighter when equipped in Spider-Man 2. Though, like before, a big reason for the difference is still just the directional lighting, and it's subject to change depending on the time of day in the scene. What has changed, though, are these extended red lines along Miles' arms that now flow straight to the back of each hand. The abdomen also now has new, more complex patterns associated with it, and the base pattern for the suit texture has gone from a series of small ovals to much smaller repeated parallelograms and interwoven nylon, giving it a richer overall look. Under the mask, the changes made to Morales are far more drastic. Unlike Peter, Miles is a much younger character, and has had a bit of a growth spurt since the last time we saw him. Not only is he now much taller than Peter, but you can see that he's grown into some of his facial features from before. His jawline is lower on his face, his cheekbones more sunken, and his nose is a bit longer. He's also switched from the previous short trim haircut to a more stylish dreadlock fade, which even plays into one of his new suits very nicely. To accompany his more mature appearance, Miles' swing animations have also evolved, with more confident flips and twirls replacing his sporadic flailing and backwards dives used previously. He still has a unique style to his swinging that differs greatly from Peter, but he feels more in control than previous versions. Pete, on the other hand, hasn't really changed all too much. His face is a little bit more rounded out this time, his hair is longer, and his neck is definitely thicker. Though, his facial features remain mostly the same as the remaster and Miles Morales game appearances. MJ, on the other hand, almost looks like a completely different person now. For one, she's let her hair down, with a simple middle part, instead of the ponytail that we saw before. In many scenes, she's also no longer wearing makeup, lipstick, or eyeliner. And like Peter, she appears a tiny bit older as well, though not by much. Character artists have also made some tweaks to MJ's teeth, reducing the spacing and giving them a more realistic texture and specular properties. Other than that though, the changes here from a technical perspective are minimal and seem limited to simple design changes, and a slight improvement to the physical properties of each respective character's hair rendering. Next up, let's talk about the environments. Now, there is a ton to talk about here, as Insomniac's recreation of New York City is not just massive, but intricately detailed to a ridiculous degree. I've spoken before about how the remaster has put in so much detail that you can actually read the nutrition label on soda cans sitting in the trash. It's easily one of the most realistic looking cities ever built for a video game, and it's easy to imagine that the environment for the sequel would borrow heavily from that previous game. And for the most part, this does happen to be the case. The base layout of Manhattan Island is very much a one-to-one -one copy from the past two games. All the buildings are in the same location, many of the same decorative objects and textures are recycled, and you'll even notice some of the same underlying pathing and spawn locations for things like NPCs being utilized. However, as you no doubt have already noticed looking at some of the footage here, things aren't quite the same this time around. For one, traffic density has been increased substantially in the sequel. In fact, there's so much traffic, I had trouble just trying to clear some space to take those character shot images from earlier as Times Square regularly seems to suffer major congestion that it never experienced before. Walking down any street, you'll find long lines of different cars all filling the roads, that by comparison, look completely empty in the first game. Interestingly, I found that crowds of NPCs are actually less dense in Spider-Man 2 than before. Times Square, Central Park, Wall Street, the NPCs just don't seem to congregate in as many large clumps. However, the NPC clothing variety has been bumped up considerably, which might explain the reduction to its density. Many of the civilians in the first Spider-Man seemed to sport some variation of black or gray clothing, which kind of made the city look like it was filled with hundreds of Mr. Smiths. But in Spider-Man 2, there's actual color on the sidewalks, with lots of different clothing styles and fabric types to mix things up. It feels much more lively, and fits well with the game's more colorful, warm aesthetic, though it is still surprising just how much the crowd density has been reduced in some places. That's not to say there's no dense crowds at all though. 
You'll find large groups of NPCs in places like the market in Brooklyn or Coney Island still. But on average, the previous two Spider-Man games seem to offer larger crowds. Another interesting change with Spider-Man 2 is that it actually sees its LOD reduced from the previous game. I had to test this a few times to be sure, but when viewing the city from a higher vantage point and zooming in extremely close on distant details, I found that in every case, Spider-Man 2 actually features less detail than its predecessor. This park, for example, sees a lower poly circle for the central fountain at this distance. These distant buildings have incorrect angles and rendering for the upper tiers of the structure and the air conditioning units are completely missing from this building, as are most of the trees on the building adjacent. My theory is that these compromises were made in order to account for the addition of this massive new section of the game world, which now accounts for over a third of the playable space. As I mentioned in my preview video a few weeks back, Spider-Man 2 lets players explore the heart of Brooklyn this time around, including the Brooklyn Bridge Park, Coney Island, and even parts of Queens up north. These areas have a very distinctive feel from the previous Manhattan sections of the map, and are used extensively throughout the course of the campaign. Because this section of the map can be seamlessly accessed by simply swinging across the bridges or flying across the East River, it's understandable that Insomniac made technical sacrifices to the arguably less important details. And truth be told, I didn't notice the lower LOD until I sat down and looked at these two games side by side very closely. What I did unfortunately notice very plainly were what I believe to be some unintended LOD glitches now and again, including this especially egregious bug, where the trees on this street were stuck in their distant LOD state despite clearly being in the active cell. Popping into the game's photo mode seemed to revert the trees to their proper form, and resetting the game from checkpoint also cleared the issue. So it's likely just a one-off bug that needs to be addressed. Unrelated to these LOD issues, I also noticed a very slight change made to the placement of Liberty Island, which has been shifted over slightly to the right for this latest game. This places it a little bit closer to where it technically should be, as the island does sit much closer to the Jersey coastline than Manhattan. Though, considering there's this weird secondary island being rendered in roughly the same spot in the remaster, maybe this too was an LOD bug I encountered, rather than an actual design change. Either way, it's being rendered properly now in Spider-Man 2. As for all the smaller, micro details, Spider-Man 2 surprisingly features quite a few little tweaks that many players may not even notice. Things like small objects being removed, or other objects being added in. Some surfaces have been completely retextured and given a different shader. And with some of the really small details, like the trash and trash cans around the city, there seems to be a lower poly count and less detail than before. Possibly another compromise made technically to allow Spider-Man 2 to run as well as it does. Not everything has been compromised though. Some areas have actually been improved upon. The texture maps for the ground, for example, do appear to be a higher fidelity, even if they don't have the same specularity as we saw before. The grass in areas like Central Park is more full and three-dimensional, and is accompanied by significantly more trees, giving the park a more full look from above and below. And while distant LODs have seen a hit to their quality, larger reflective objects like buildings with lots of glass windows now appear to show either a ray trace reflection or cube map of the nearby skyline, whereas before, these same buildings appeared totally blank from the same position. Some of the adjustments made even have story-related reasons for the change. The massive skyscraper erected in Harlem, for example, is the result of the private energy company Roxxon having set up shop during the events of Miles Morales. The large construction site used during the infamous Puddlegate mission in the first Spider-Man game has also been fully completed for Spider-Man 2. And the Fink Tower building, seen here outside Central Park, has been replaced by a seemingly more generic building though Marvel fans may want to check the rooftop for a fun easter egg. And finally, there's the Chrysler building, that, like Miles Morales, has sadly been replaced with this weird-looking structure instead. This change has more to do with a licensing issue with the real-life owners of the building, so sadly, this structure at the moment is only available to climb in the original game. Then we have the lighting, that's been tweaked slightly as we've discussed previously. Whether it's daytime, evening, or night, Spider-Man 2 has a much brighter appearance, with what looks like additional bloom and ambient light sources. 
The game still locks the time of day to ideal conditions relative to the narrative sections players are experiencing, and will even change the time of day for side missions when necessary. Other lighting effects like light volumes, god rays, and specularity are used liberally throughout just as before. And the dynamic lighting associated with things like explosions, muzzle flashes, and other sci-fi or magic related effects look as fantastic as ever. For fans of the ray trace reflections introduced with the remaster, those same exact ray trace reflections are being used once more, and they come with a few small improvements as well. Windowed reflections, for example, now show more details than before, like this card of books that previously was completely missing in the reflected image. Projectiles and other miscellaneous effects are also visible in reflections, whereas before, these things were not visible at all. And finally, the surface of the water now sports some ray trace reflections too, which along with the improved water simulation, makes the body of water surrounding the city look far more realistic than ever before. The only thing that I'd really like to see is a way to manually change the time of day like in the previous game. Now, there's no way to change the time of day outside of advancing the story. So, once you finish the campaign, you're pretty much stuck in this broad daylight setting, with no option to swap to nighttime or evening like you could before. The game's shadows have received some very slight improvements too, which I only noticed after manually tweaking the lighting to match up with the time of day in Spider-Man Remastered. As you can see from this example, the border of this softened shadow projection is significantly less pixelated than before, and renders cleanly against the surface of the road. From a normal view distance, this wouldn't be all that noticeable, though it's an improvement nonetheless. Like the LODs, the long distance shadow rendering for smaller objects like trees, radio towers, and water towers have been reduced slightly, though I did at least notice that large structures like buildings seem to cast more shadows at distance than before, making scenes like this one feel more dense as a result. Moving on, we have effects. Effects in the previous Spider-Man games already looked phenomenal, with numerous particle effects for all the various sci-fi weapons and supernatural abilities making for impressive combat scenarios. Several different forms of fire alphas emit at set points to create the illusion of towering infernos, and massive city-wide destruction is expertly crafted into the game's big set piece moments to create something as epic as what you'd see on the big screen. And while many of these effects are retained in the sequel with more or less the same level of quality, there's a few areas where the sequel improves too. Water rendering in particular has been dramatically improved, with more realistic wave simulation in the Hudson and East River, coupled with the implementation of partial ray trace reflections, similar to those used on the windows around the city. It looks much better than the screen space reflections used before, and best of all, players are no longer stopped dead when they mistakenly drop down into it as new gameplay mechanics like this skiing animation have been incorporated to ensure players are given a chance to maintain the traversal momentum. Like with the remaster and Miles Morales, Spider-Man 2 also sees a bump to its particle density too, which comes into play quite often during the larger chase sequences and scripted moments. Though the most impressive new effects are the sand rendering used primarily in the opening sequence, where players are faced with a massive Sandman giant, and will need to scale large dunes of sand in and around nearby structures. To help sell the effect, the artist put in some nice ground deformation here, making sand slide and roll as players walk across it. And to help play into the continuity of the game's story, pockets of sand can even be found in varying amounts around the city, which is a nice touch. The new symbiote effects are very impressive too, which are used extensively with Peter's new symbiote combat abilities though you'll just have to play through the campaign yourself to see how else they're utilized in the game's art direction. Moving on, let's take a brief dive into the actual gameplay mechanics, starting with how the open world is handled. In the original Spider-Man, the city of New York was split into multiple districts, each with their own set amount of optional activities, side missions, and collectibles to discover. To achieve 100% game completion, players would need to complete both the main campaign along with each of the optional mission checklists for all nine districts. This includes the blue side missions that were slightly more narrative driven and expansive, but not quite as robust as the main campaign missions. Then there's the collectible backpacks, the pigeon chases, landmarks to photograph, environmental research stations, task masker challenges, 
black cat stakeouts, and several different types of enemy strongholds and outposts to conquer. Mixed in with these more structured activities were several different random crime opportunities that regularly pop up in the game world, each with special bonus objectives to keep players experimenting with different stealth and combat techniques. By completing open world activities, players earn tokens, which can be used to purchase new spidey suits and gadgets. And because each of these items usually require different types of tokens, players are encouraged to really branch out and experience everything that the game has to offer. The problem with this is that the game relies heavily on its repetitive random crime system to drive overall completion. Players are required to complete dozens of random crimes per district to cross it off their checklist, making the mechanic feel more like a chore than the intended immersive element it was designed to be. Spider-Man 2 thankfully does away with the random crime requirements. Each district now operates with their own individual progression bar that rewards the player based on how many activities were completed within that district. Complete a random crime, XP is added to that progress bar. Complete a larger side mission though, and even more XP is added. Each district progression bar offers three milestone rewards, including resources for player upgrades, and the ability to fast travel anywhere within the district instantly, which, with the help of the PS5's storage capabilities, really is instantaneous. By designing it this way, the random crimes feel more optional. Though, considering each district has a limited amount of structured activities, it may still be necessary to complete at least some random crimes in order to achieve 100% completion. The random crimes themselves have also been reimagined, expanding in some areas while simplifying the more repetitive aspects of others. The basic drug deals and robberies from before are now more involved this time and may involve a burning fuel truck or even clever hunter ambushes to catch the player off guard. They even tweaked some of the more repetitive aspects of the returning random crime elements like the car chases, removing the requirement to systematically remove everyone from the speeding car and just have the player neutralize the driver instead, and no more button mashing quick time event to stop the car either. Spider-Man 2 also avoids recycling any of the old side missions and open world activities too. Everything here feels fresh and new, setting this version of New York apart greatly from its predecessor. Optional open world activities include unique side missions from the returning Friendly Neighborhood Spider app, Marco's Memories where you need to clear out some of Sandman's minions and break open a crystal, a new set of photo ops that focus more on the culture and people of New York rather than the landmarks. Prowler stashes that function as investigative puzzles to unlock lots of rare resources. Hidden spider bots that function a lot like the backpacks from before, but aren't as numerous and seem to reference different Spider-Men from other dimensions. Hunter blinds that test the player's stealth and combat skills, much like the various enemy outposts from before. And several more fleshed out multi-part side missions that help to expand on Peter and Miles' character outside of the main campaign. Speaking of which, Spider-Man 2 also allows players to seamlessly swap between both heroes on the fly. When exploring the open world, players need simply open the Friendly Neighborhood Spider app and press and hold the square button to instantly swap to the other spider person. This allows players to play around with an entirely different set of player abilities and upgrades, while also granting players access to otherwise inaccessible missions. Now and again, players may even encounter their counterpart when responding to one of the many random crime events, where they'll help fight off the enemies alongside you. This can sometimes make the bonus objectives a little bit more difficult, as they'll sometimes finish off enemies before you've completed a task, though it's a rare enough occurrence that it maintains its novelty, and getting that little Spider-Man pointing meme to trigger is always good for a laugh. Each spider person offers their own unique style of combat, stealth, and traversal as well, that have all been expanded upon further in the sequel. For players familiar with either the first Spider-Man game or the standalone expansion Miles Morales, some of these aspects should already be familiar to you. Both Miles and Peter control mostly the same, with a series of single button combos mixed with dodges, jumps, and unique finishers. But new to Spider-Man 2 is the parry button, that can be used to block incoming damage, or even stun the attacker. The sequel relies heavily on this new mechanic, and even introduces specific enemy types that require parries to fight effectively, as the dodge button won't work. 
add on top of this the crush attacks that can't be parried but must be dodged, and the new parry system can feel a bit overwhelming to players used to the old Spider-Man combat. Spider-Man 2 also adds with it new special ability attacks that can be triggered by holding L1 and pressing the corresponding face button. Each Spider-Man has two different sets of these abilities. Peter can use spider arms that deliver rapid strikes, or his new symbiote abilities that offer powerful room clearing options. Miles, on the other hand, has two different forms of bioelectricity attacks, including his old orange venom energy that seems to be more AOE focused, and the new blue electricity that involves more chain lightning attacks. Both characters also have their own super attacks, triggered by filling the meter in the top right corner. Peter's is called the Symbiote Surge, that lets him rapidly attack enemies with powerful strikes that trigger finishers almost instantly. And Miles lets off a powerful Venom Blast that's perfect for clearing out large groups of enemies surrounding him. Along with abilities, Spider-Man 2 also reimagines how the gadgets are handled. In the first Spider-Man game, there's eight unlockable gadgets, most of which are some variation to Peter's web shooter. There's your standard rapid fire webs, the impact webs that were slower but wrapped up enemies instantly, electric webs that arced between multiple enemies, the web bomb, trip mines, concussive blasts, spider drone, and a suspension matrix that sends enemies flying into the air. Spider-Man 2 scraps a good chunk of these. The standard web shooters are still at play, but there's only four different unique gadgets to play with now. There's the upshot, that fires out little missiles that launch enemies into the air, much like the suspension matrix from before. The web grabber, that like the trip mine, will pull enemies together, but can also be upgraded to pull in random objects nearby for extra damage. The concussion blast returns, but has been reimagined as the sonic burst. And lastly, there's the ricochet web, that will bounce around between multiple enemies, useful for slowing down larger groups. Gadget selection overall doesn't feel like much of an improvement. In fact, the removal of helpful stealth gadgets like the trip mine does feel like a step back. Though, being able to trigger a gadget without having to open a gadget wheel like before is a nice touch, and keeps players in the action for longer. Moving on from gadgets, we can't forget to talk about the suits. Spider-Man 2 has completely reimagined the game's suits to be more functional without compromising the player's actual gameplay capabilities. This means the old system, where every suit offered their own unique focus ability and modifications, has been totally scrapped, in favor of making each suit purely cosmetic. To account for this, Spider-Man 2 adds with it a new menu called Suit Tech, where players can make universal upgrades to the Spidey suit. This includes upgrades to health, traversal, combat, and focus, which should keep players wearing the suit that they actually like without compromises. Moving on from suits, we have the skill tree. This functions about the same as it has in the past two games. Players rank up by completing missions and activities, earn skill points, and then spend those on new moves and special skills. Thankfully, many of the skills learned in the past games are not taking up space here. So things like the swing kick and perfect dodge are available right from the get-go. These new skill upgrades instead seem to target the various new features offered in the game mainly things like new combat abilities, upgrades to those abilities, and even more helpful traversal options. Speaking of which, Spider-Man 2 does a lot to mix up its widely praised traversal systems. The base swinging system functions about the same as you remember, with R2 being used to throw out webs at any nearby tall structure, coupled with a really nice sense of momentum depending on the timing that the player releases the trigger. Though, with the right upgrades, players can literally fly through New York City now, with swing speeds being nearly doubled, and new features like the slingshot launch, swing loop, and web wings being extremely useful tools to cross the city at breakneck speeds. Spider-Man 2 also takes the cornering from before and makes it available for the base swinging animation, rather than just limiting it to the wall running mechanic like before, which makes a huge difference in navigating tight corners during chases. For players somehow tired of swinging through Manhattan, Spider-Man 2 also makes fast travel far easier, allowing players to simply click any spot on the map and instantly teleport to that location. There's a bit of a grind to unlock these fast travel points that I feel is a bit unnecessary, but once these are unlocked, getting around New York is much more convenient than before where you were stuck using the subway. And then of course we have the stealth mechanics. 
Stealth is an often overlooked aspect of the Spider-Man games that I feel has offered a great deal of variety to the experience, akin to the likes of the Batman Arkham games. Swinging from high vantage points and wrapping up enemies is incredibly satisfying, and the overall stealth sandbox offers a nice alternative to combat in many situations. Spider-Man 2 only sees a few changes to these mechanics, though these changes greatly expand the formula to give players more of an advantage than ever before. By simply aiming and shooting out a web, players can create new web lines wherever they want, allowing for intricate networks of high-wire vantage points to pick away at the enemy. Players can also upgrade their skills to take down two enemies at once, and with the returning invisibility power Miles brings to the table, stealth feels significantly easier than ever before. To make some of the later stealth sequences more challenging, Spider-Man 2 does add in unique enemy types like these robotic bird drones, Though, a quick zip takedown can make short work of these without much trouble. Now, there's a lot more to talk about when it comes to the gameplay, including other mission types, traversal systems, and combat abilities. Though for the sake of time, and avoiding spoilers, let's go ahead and wrap up with a brief sound comparison. Which game do you feel offers the best audio quality and design? Hey, just taking a break. Hello. Are you really him? I know you saved the city. But don't think I'm not watching you. I got eyes like a hawk. Don't slip up. Listen, you know me. I love dogs. I just don't like picking up after them when they aren't mine. Got to pick up some Colby yeah. and some Goji for tomorrow night. Oh, maybe some dog is the only one in the building. Big enough to leave a mess come like here on New Year's Eve. One of these Same years. Days, Escape prisoners. Let's see what I can do about the escape part. Sorry to interrupt your romantic evening. City's falling apart. I've got to put a stop to Lee and Otto fast. Who's that? It's Spider Man! He won't be seen. Hope you don't mind me interrupting here! <laughs> <laughs> To you guys you know I'm around and yet still you try this stuff respect those lunatics will kill someone driving like that
Okay, you are not getting five stars. Curbside service. Now that's just... Reckless driving, not great. Who's the spider? Move it! Think you ran a few reds, guys! Think you got us, huh? And that wraps up this episode of Direct Comparison. Overall, Spider-Man 2 is an incredibly impressive follow-up to an already fantastic superhero open-world experience. While it doesn't necessarily set the bar much higher, the bar was already pretty high to begin with. The remaster of Spider-Man and its follow-up Miles Morales still, after three years, holds up extremely well on the PlayStation 5. The game's excellent dynamic resolution and rock-solid performance deliver a consistently good presentation. Whether you choose to play at the game's fidelity setting, or the performance ray tracing mode. What's more, the game can achieve incredibly impressive frame rates when played on a compatible VRR display, pushing up to nearly 50 FPS in fidelity mode, and sometimes in the hundreds in performance mode. From a visual standpoint, we did discover a few technical compromises to the image quality, including lower LODs and lower asset quality on occasion. But the sacrifices are arguably worth it, considering the massive increase to the playable space, in addition to a plethora of other technical improvements like higher quality ray trace reflections, increased traffic density, better water simulation, and blistering fast loading speeds. Alongside these technical changes, Spider-Man 2 also delivers when it comes to the gameplay, simplifying some elements to be easier to understand, while introducing lots of new maneuvers and nuance to help the game stand apart from its predecessors. The story delivers in a big way too, with lots of fun fan service mixed in, with pretty much everything you'd want to see in a story involving two Spider-Men, Venom and Kraven. I feel there are areas where they may have played it a bit too safe, but I think overall, the campaign is one of Insomniac's best, and fans should be happy with the big reveals and surprises that await. But what do you guys think? Are you going to be picking up Spider-Man 2, or do you feel that the past two Spider-Man games did things better? Let me know in the comments section, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more content like this posted every week.